Hey, fellow Citrix user group uh, community aficionados, welcome to our uh, afternoon session with Jarian Gibson. Uh, Jarian's one of the CTPs in the Citrix organization, and I think if I remember right, there's only like 75 of them worldwide, so it's a huge distinction and honor. He's also one of the leaders of the Kansas City uh, user group as well, and has just been a powerhouse in the organization for, uh, in, in our community for the last 11, 12, 15 years. Uh, I know I was a regular subscriber to his podcast uh, uh, several years ago, which is always a great way of, of keeping in tune to, to our, our work. I got the privilege of meeting Brian in person. He came up to one of our user group meetings in the Twin Cities maybe three years ago. Uh, he spoke for us, and then afterwards, uh, he and I uh, were able to grab a few beers and discuss uh, some things in more detail. It took me about three minutes to realize I was talking to one of the five smartest people I've ever talked to in my life. Uh, and did it in a way that he didn't intimidate me. Uh, so an absolute uh, amazing person who, who's now in a great organization of Nutanix. So uh, Darian, welcome and cheers. Thank you and thanks for having me. Thanks for joining. So, all right, welcome um, today uh, to the CGC XL for the Great Lakes. Um, I'm happy to be back again. Um, I actually spoke at the, the Great Lakes last year um, with the four groups that were involved and happy this year to see there's five groups now with uh, Minneapolis St. Paul being involved. Uh, I spoke last year on Office 365 um, in Citrix, which was a very popular session. I think I hit all the XLs with that session last year and that's always a evergreen evolving thing as things change and as things are improved. Um, this year, they approached me to come and talk about uh, multi-sites, high availability. Uh, this is something that uh, a group of us that I'll talk about, uh, we, we've been working on uh, for a couple of years now. Uh, four of us got, first started with three of us, then four of us got together, and I'll talk about those individuals. Um, and we, we've done two sessions at Synergy. We continue to do testing and talk with each other um, and working on a group project together as well. Um, with a lot of content being in this session, I kind of broke this down to multi-sites, recommended practices, considerations, uh, things I'm seeing from from day to day going on, uh, questions I come across, conversations I have. And so I hit some things uh, along those lines for this session. Uh, nice thing was that the session before with uh, Ryan, he hit some good things around Citrus Cloud, uh, different models, some high availability, having some components on-prem going all in cloud. Uh, so some good things there that Ryan covered for the access side in his session. Uh, so good that I'm not going to cover that because he hit some of those pretty well. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with the session. Uh, again, my name is Jarian Gibson. Um, I'm happy to support uh, the CUGC. I'm a co-leader in Kansas City. Uh, we were one of the early groups. Um, and we've also done a couple XL as well. Um, so again, happy to always support CUGC, other XLs, other groups, also a CTP. Um, and in the past two years, I've worked at Nutanix as a senior solutions architect, and you can talk with me on Twitter at Jarian Gibson. So the agenda here, uh, kind of get a, get an intro uh, to what the, the group we are, our past sessions, some things we're working on, um, and then talk about multi-sites, uh, why and what is multi-sites, uh, talk about some planning things that always seem to be tops of conversation. You know, we can go further into planning, but there's some pretty hot topics that always come to, to mind when I'm talking with individuals looking at multi-site or we as a group are talking with each other or the other members within our group that we work, we work with are talking as well. Then the next thing we'll do is talk about infrastructure, uh, some key things there around infrastructure components. We'll get into Active Directory, uh, a couple things there, things that uh, two pretty pressing things that I always see pop up. So we'll talk about that. Persona is a big one, especially when you get into multi-site and high availability because if a user logs in, they don't have their their settings, their configurations, their information, their data, um, them pretty much doing what they need to do is not gonna be the best user experience for them and is going to be a, uh, a, pr a pretty bad uh, and unuseful session for them. Image management, this one's always a big one. Um, moving images around, multi-sites, multi-cluster, multi-environment and so forth. Uh, and then we'll get into other considerations. So first thing we'll talk about is the multi-site team. Um, this is not just myself. It started off with uh, myself and Shane Kleinert doing a lot of conversations. Uh, then Dave Broad uh, came in. The three of us initially did a session at Synergy two years ago. And then we started uh, having our conversations with, uh, with Case uh, Baggerman, my, my, uh, my coworker. 
And with the four of us, we have more conversations. And then we came together and did a another session last year around this uh, at Synergy as well. So uh, four CTPs in, in the group, uh, all of us are on here. Um, you can follow them on Twitter as well. But we you know we, we continually talk uh, via WhatsApp, via Slack, and so forth. And as things evolve with the multi-site stuff, new versions of Citrix, um, things change in the storage and the infrastructure and the hypervisor landscape. Uh, things change like in low balancing and ADC and cloud and DNS. We're always talking, always communicating uh, and working together. Um, like I said, we've done some previous sessions, so I put them in the in the deck here. If you scan the QR codes, they'll take you right to the YouTube videos of our past sessions. Uh, it's about 90, I'm sorry, 135 minutes of content there. Uh, so our original one with the three of us and then our second one last year with the four of us. And then some other things we're working on, um, we were planning to... Um, to present this year at Synergy, uh, some customer use cases that we've worked on uh, between the four of us, because uh, Dave's a customer, Shane's a partner, myself and Case work at the vendor side. So we, we've kind of seen the full uh, spectrum of different customer use cases when it comes to multi-site. Uh, so hopefully we'll be able to do that soon um, in some kind of virtual event or, or next year at Synergy when we all get together again, um, once we can get through all, all these, these trying times. Um, we've also been working on a website, too, that's coming soon with a bunch of content and a bunch more testing as we're going through and working on, on things. Uh, so first thing we're going to talk about is multi-site. Why and what is multi-site? And let me just check the QA real quick because I have a question pop up. So I'll just stop for a second here and check that. It looks like it's uh, it's gone, so Okay. <laughs> So why and what is multi-site? Um, multi-site can mean a number of different things. It, it can mean things like, you know, single data center, multi-data center, multi-location. Um, a couple of things can, can be multi-site. So we're going to go ahead and go through and talk about why and what is multi-site. So the first thing here is going to be uh, experience, right? So why multi-site with experience? Um, whether we've been in multi-data center, single data center, um, any of those different options, we've all worked in some way or form in uh, multi-site experience, right? Even from doing, let's, let's talk about internal with a single data center. Um, even with a single data center, we may have um, multiple pods in there that we have to manage and maintain as we do in large scale environments or for some kind of internal redundancy inside of that location. So even in a single data center, we can have multi-site based on pods, based on our high availability within that data center and so forth. And then going from there, we could have regional multiple DCs where that could be a, a secondary location, whether it, it's production, whether it's a, a cold site for DR and we'll, we're just replicating data there, um, or it could be global where we have a global footprint and we have users all over the world and we need to route them to uh, the closest access point for location for user experience, and then from there have multiple locations they can fail over to if there's an issue in their main data center. So that's kind of the experience. Um, it can also be not just our own data centers. It can also be uh, cloud, you know, whether it's hybrid model where we're doing primarily on-site and our secondary or DR site in the cloud, or we can do full on cloud where we're going cloud first and doing everything uh, in the cloud uh, from there. So that's kind of the experience um, of, of why multi-site. Uh, the satisfaction of multi-site. So why multi-site? Because we want satisfaction. The main thing here is that we want to see things carry on in event of some kind of failure, whether it's in one DC, multiple DCs, one component, single components. The main thing here is that we want to be able to continue on and work if there is going to be uh, a single server, like storefront or delivery controller, uh, an ADC, or if we have a full service outage and that whole data, ser uh, data center is down, um, and maybe someone has cut the internet, um, we've had a power outage, you know, those type of things, uh, a major component like, uh, like SQL database has gone down and so forth. Um, that's the way that we want to, you know, have that satisfaction is being able to make sure that we can architect and design components to where if we lose something, it's not going to bring everything down. So that's the satisfaction of it. <clears throat> and then the time for why multi-site. Um, with having a good multi-site design, having the satisfaction of being able to know if I lose something, if something goes down, 
things can still continue to run. There's no interruption of service. So that gives me more time to focus on enhancements, focus on improving my multi-site design, um, and let's focus on looking at failure um, components and looking more at um, improvements instead. Um, so that, that's where the time comes in. So by starting off with a good design, um, we're gonna have good experience for our user landscape. We're gonna have the satisfaction uh, being able to make sure that we can withstand any kind of failure in our environments. And then we also will have the time to be able to further improve that design, um, look at focusing on other things, um, looking at upgrades, migrations, and that kind of stuff. So that's kind of why we do multi-sites. And again, multi-site doesn't have to be multiple physical locations. We can be multi-site within the same data center as well by building things out as pods. So think about that too as well as we go forward. So let's talk about what is multi-site. Uh, the dictionary definition is having uh, more than one site. And again, this could be a pod when it relates to a Citrix site. This could be multiple locations, uh, whether it's your data center, multiple data centers, cloud, a mix of hybrid, and so forth. Um, but the main thing is we're spreading services and splitting services across multiple access points so we don't have a single point of failure, uh, so there's not a interruption to our, our users and so forth. Um, so common scenarios are going to be active, active. Everyone wants to get to active, active, but what does that really mean? How much can we make? We truly make active, active. Um, as things have progressed, we're getting better at being able to do active, active. There's still some scenarios we can't do full active, active. Now, we can do active, active by splitting users across data centers um, and going to the pin model to say you go here first, and then you go to the opposite site um, if your primary site goes down. Um, active passive, um, that's when we're seeing a lot uh, to where it's a DR site, whether it's a cold site, a warm site, um, it's DR as a service type things, but that's what we look at as an active passive. Um, and then, you know, where you look at to, to start in those considerations. So look at things like uh, pushing user, users to the closest geographical location, uh, allowing failures, um, you know, look at the, the performance. So if I fail over from site A to site B, how's that gonna impact my user experience? How's that gonna impact the load of users there if I'm in an active active and splitting the load? Um, but again, you know, user experience is gonna be key here because if the users aren't happy, if the users can't get to their, to do their jobs, get to the workloads, that's where we start getting those calls and that's where we start having those problems come in. Um, you know, look at, again, performance, multiple paths to services, fast path to services, but like I said, user experience is, is the main thing here. So they are the key to user acceptance when it comes to uh, multi-site here. So let's go ahead and look at what does, uh, you know, consider when we're doing an active, active multi-site uh, deployment here. So the first thing is people, especially if we are in the global environment as one of the use cases I first talked about, um, we have various people spread out globally, different cult cultures, different working times, different expectation, uh, expectations and needs uh, when they get into an environment. Once you go further, they're gonna have devices. And so, you know, we can't always control devices. We may have, you know, a company standard of, you're gonna use these type of devices, these operating systems. We may have a BYO type environment where we have to support any device the user brings to as long as they can connect to their environment and as long as they can get in and do their job, we don't care at their device, we have our multiple layer security in place to make sure they can do that. Um, you know, laptops, mobile devices, IoT devices, thin, thin clients, you know, that list keeps going on and on and on. Then we have access points. Um, you know, connectivity of that device to some kind of access point into our environment. Um, this could be a trusted or an untrusted access point. The main thing here is depending where they are, depending on service availability, that access point can be different data speeds, different experience on that side as well. So things we have to account for, again, because user experience and all this is key, and that's why we're building this. So that's one thing, another thing we think about there as well. Then data. The last thing is, you know, without the data, you know, what's the point of accessing the environment? If the users can't get to their configuration and they can't get their applications and they can't get to their data to be able to function, to do what they need to do, then we're kind of just like providing access, but really nothing's going on there. So data is really important. So data needs to be protected. 
Um, we also have to look at as uh, things like uh, GDPR and local privacy laws and that kind of stuff, making sure those are adhered to. Um, like I said, without the data, the access is really useless. So the data needs to be there. So building redundancy around that, making sure they have that data. Um, and then also it needs to be responsive. So we can't have any kind of degradation of accessing that data um, because again, that goes back to the users and that goes back to the user experience. Um, and then so what happens when we do some kind of multi-site function here uh, to link up all these seamlessly? Uh, again, globally spread users out everywhere, different access points trying to come in and be able to function and, and do their roles. So what happens if one fails, right? What do we do there? And, and again, that's why we plan for multi-site because if that location fails or something in that location fails where it can't be recovered in that location, we need to route them to another suitable region. And so seamlessly having them reconnect, come into another location, maybe the next closest location to have better user experience and to make sure that their applications and their data is there, that way they can continue to work and not have any issues. So that's kind of uh, another thing of, of what is multi-site, kind of why we're doing it and, and looking at it. Now, I mentioned active, active, global, and that's kind of complex, you know, ish, and that's gonna kind of depend on what is our definition of active, active. Are we trying to say, no matter where you are, you're always going to the closest location, or are we gonna say, you're always gonna go to a certain location first and then pick another active location as your backup point. Um, the one thing here with doing anything active, active uh, is there's lots of moving parts to account for as technology increases or improves, as things get better, um, things are getting easier. And I'll talk about some of those things, but you know, there's still a lot of moving parts here. A lot of things we have to test and account for, um, a lot of places where you can go wrong. Um, and then just think about you know, cases uh, on this with our session we did this, had a very good example of a car, uh, just a car engine. Uh, lots of moving parts, lots of ways it can be configured. Um, and lots of different tools you have to use to make sure you can build that engine. We're not just going to have a hammer and hitting nails. We may need a wrench, maybe a screwdriver. We may need um, an impact wrench, you know, different things to get the job done. Uh, but the thing here is, is knowing what you want to deliver, make sure you have a plan, document that plan, have a design, take your time, make sure you go through your steps, test it, um, and then make sure it's solid before you go live to your end users. Because again, it's all about your end users. And you don't want to get a situation to where it's a user experience issue and users are complaining um, because then it's coming down on, onto you uh, for that. So what is multi-site? Um, and then again here, I'm going to check the QA real quick as we're going. <laughs> Someone says, good answer here, you know, drunk guy with the, with the backhoe. And actually, um, Speaking about backhoe, I've been in a situation to where the internet lines were cut in a building because they were digging. Uh, the lines weren't properly marked, um, and they dug, and they cut the lines. And if the company was at the time, this is before I started consulting um, when I was an administrator at a company uh, early in my career. Um, they had multiple internet connections converge in the same spot in the building. So where they were digging at actually cut all of the um, internet connectivity for that company where they did a lot of trading stuff online. And so that's a good point there about having those multiple points of access. And from there on, the internet links came in different parts of the building after that, and that issue didn't happen again. So that's a good point about what, what the backhoe, because I've been through that, uh, that situation. So what is multi-site? And we kind of break it down here. Uh, the most dictionary turn here is basically having one or more, uh, one or more sites, right, to be able to, to do that. Um, but if we have, you know, something goes down, being able to move them to a, another service, another site seamlessly uh, if there's no issue. I'm sorry, if there's an issue. So when EUC, you know, in the Citrix world, we want to make sure we have that accounted for, whether it's multiple services in the same data center or multiple services spread across multiple data centers, uh, which can be provided from more than one site. Um, again, it can be within the same data center because we can account within the same data center or go across multiple data centers depending on our design, depending on our plan. But the main thing here is to seamlessly fail over that user between them um, and be able to have the same user experience when they were start and, and so forth. And then looking at that 
you know, basically a granular approach, approach to all the different layers in the site and making sure those are all accounted for as, as far as being redundant and highly available. And again, that's data, that's networking, that's storage, that's applications, that's access points, et cetera. So looking here at planning, and again, you fail to plan, then plan to fail. And so let's talk about some of the key planning concepts um, that I talk about with customers daily and when I get engaged and even before I was consulting is why do uh, failures happen? And so one thing is we have planned failures and then we have unplanned failures. Um, I gave some you know, example there of a good unplanned failure of having our internet link cut um, that actually happened. Um, we've seen where cloud services can go down um, and that can cause interruption. And that's why when we do anything in the cloud, we try to go across multiple availability zones if we can. That way, if one goes down, we don't have any issues uh, to disrupt uh, service to our users. Uh, power outages have happened. Uh, I know Dave, when we did a session at Synergy, he talked about what happened to his company with the power outage. Um, also, too, in our design, I talked about uh, design being key. And as you design, write things down, making sure you're accounting for things, make sure that you're testing each, each thing that you put in that design. Maybe we missed something. And so that's when an unplanned failure happens with a design issue. We didn't think about something. We didn't thoroughly test something. We missed something in our planning. But then look at our, some of our planned options here. Uh, we have maintenance, right? So we're going to be doing an upgrade. We're going to be doing uh, patches. Um, we're going to be introducing uh, new hardware into the environment. Uh, migration is one. We you know with Citrix, we might be doing a swing migration from one site to another. I'm sorry, one version to another and using separate sites for that instead of upgrading, and then using something like Storefront or Workspace to, to swing those sites over as we're doing that. Um, and then redesign, maybe we say, okay, we did our initial design, but as our environment changed, as our user set grew, as requirements changed, we may have to come back and redesign to account for those changes. And so that's some things there of why failures happen. The next thing is gonna be business considerations. And so this one's a, a big one. And we always say start with business considerations when it comes to multi-site uh, availability. Um, why we start business requirements? Because we want to make sure that the technology that we are buying works to our, what our business requirements are. We're not trying to change our business requirements to work for that technology. And so that's why you're looking at multiple vendors, different products, different things, testing things, because we want to make sure that everything we're doing starts with the business, not the other, not with the technology. Uh, and I've been in situations where the technology came first, and then it's like, well, we have to buy this, bolt this on, change this, because we start with technology instead of starting with the business. And so when it comes to the business, something to think about is financial impact, right? And that's going to be cost. What's the cost? You know, uh, if I'm doing multiple data centers, what's the, what's the cost of my business of that? If I'm going to instead do one main data center and do uh, DR as a service, as an example, another one, what's the cost there? If I'm gonna go into cloud, what's the cost there? The staff, do I have the proper staff in place? Do I have to train the staff? Do I have to add more staff? And then what's the risk to the business if say, look, I'm just gonna go with this one site, I'm gonna make that one site as resilient as possible, but if we lose like something happens in the region, you know, what's the risk to the business if I can't function for X amount of time in my business and we're seeing here within, in, you know, in unfortunate times of COVID where if some business can't work, they can't come back. And so we have to look at the risks of the business, how we have to change the business in certain things like, you know, even COVID as an example. And so go from there. Then define your requirements. So who, and when I mean who, who are my business critical users, right? What workloads need to be protected? And for those workloads I'm protecting for those business critical users, what things on the back end, like application services, data services, and so forth, needs to be protected as well. Then we have to look at our RPO, which is our recovery point in time objective, and then our RTO, which is our recovery time objective as well. And But the main thing here is when you define your requirements, try to keep things as simple as possible with your architecture. The more complex it is, the more costly it is, the more difficult it is going to be to change, to maintain, uh, to expand as things go out. And then look at your protection strategy, right? Where? Um, once we know the who, where are we going to protect them to? Is Do we have the expertise to have a second data center? Do we need to look at a colo? Do we look at the cloud? Do we look at DR as a service? So that's kind of the where. And then the tools. So I'll talk about tools um, as it relates to 
my storage, my hypervisor, my infrastructure, are those tools built in? Do I have to buy a third party tool? Do I have to look at changing the way I'm doing things? What tools do I have to make, to make sure that whatever I'm architecting, where my strategy is, whatever I'm protecting, that I have the proper tools in place to be able to uh, protect those workloads? And then workload protection uh, and infrastructure, again, back to who, what things do I need to protect, what workloads do I need to protect, what infrastructure is being in place to have that. So that's where our business considerations come into play. So multi-site supporting technology. So when we talk about this, this is kind of, you know, do I have application level um, capabilities? Do I have infrastructure? Do I have to buy something third party? You know, so what things we have in the Citrix stack that support multi-site technology? If you look at this graphic here, we have all kinds of things here that support it, uh, multi-site technology. Uh, virtual apps and desktops between the on-prem and cloud, we have some things built into the software. Um, looking at our site type, we can make some things active, 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 passive based on things like GSLB from the ADC from from um, Citrix. Um, you know, doing multiple circuits with virtual WAN from SD WAN, WAN optimization for users coming in across different connections in different areas. Um, you know, the list goes on and on and on. But what things support multi-site here? You know, we have things like you know PVS. We can quickly copy that VDS image around. Um, layered images, we can export that and move that around. Uh, full clones can get tricky. Um, because of the, if it's a full clone machine being used, and then look at replication, you know, a hypervisor, third-party products like Backup2, Peer, um, DFSR built into Windows, and then, you know, FS Logics with Cloud Cache to move that user persona around. Um, and then again, uh, you know, different things here to look at for multi-site uh, supporting technology. And then, so what are key concepts, right? So the one thing here is, is failure domains. Um, and what is a failure domain? That's going to be basically a, a pod or an architecture that I have um, to where that goes down. What's my redundant? What's my backup? What's my high availability copy of that? And what within that failure domain can I sustain failures to keep that up or move to another failure domain? Um, the one thing here with failure domains, you know, the bigger they are, the longer the maintenance, the, the, the longer the windows, things you have to consider. Then we have smaller failure domains, usually quicker maintenance. Um, smaller impact to user uh, if something goes down and so forth. So that's a failure domain. And then the other one is plan and expect failures. And the reason why we have monkey here is, you know, think about the chaos monkey where I think it's uh, the, the some of the cloud providers like uh, cloud services like Netflix where they have a chaos monkey that just goes in and, and constantly tries to break stuff. That way they can find the different uh, issues in their environment and then fix those if there's an outage in that environment. So that's why we want to plan and expect failure. So one, we can know where they are, we can fix them, but also two, we know what can our pods, what can our failure domain withstand if something goes down or if we have some kind of issue. So the next one is know your workloads. This one's always a fun one um, because knowing your workloads, where they live. So we may have two data centers spread across two different uh, regions. So one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast. So we gotta understand what's in those regions, what happens if one of the regions go down, you know, where can I fail over to, to the other region if I sustain some kind of outage or service corruption in that region? And then look at your presentation there, like Citrix, you know, how can we make that active active uh, using things like uh, like one single site, multiple zones we'll talk about, uh, multiple sites, making the active active, GSLB on the front end, storefront, workspace on the cloud services. Look at your identity layer, <coughs> excuse me, look at your identity layer how to make that active active because you know without authentication without knowing who's coming into our environments we really can't do anything so those top two layers are pretty important for getting access into the environment but once they're into the environment things like their data uh any kind of database stuff as an example web tier application tier uh, again if they can't do their applications they can't get to their services then those first two layers are are kind of um useless and they can't do anything once they get in. And then we got to think about our backup and recovery services as well. Uh, do we have to look at third-party products? Are they built into the to infrastructure and so forth? And how long does it take us to recover anything we have to go into our backup and recovery services for? <clears throat> so site design, one of the main things here is in our site design, are we gonna go with a, a single site, multiple zones? Are we going to go to uh, multiple sites? Uh, are we going to go to a single empty root zone? 
Um, you know, are we geographically spread across where we have to have a site and then looking at some kind of aggregation in the front end, GSLB, workspace, storefront, and so forth, um, optimal gateway routing, those type of things. Um, you know, looking at our business decisions, how they apply to this for reliability, I'm sorry, reliability versus manageability, and then looking at security, how that complicates things, uh, our failure domains, our pot architecture, um, mission critical workloads, and then flexibility during upgrades. Uh, again, this all comes into play. Uh, one of the nice things I saw with Ryan is he mentioned that migration tool or that, that tool that they, they talked about uh, for taking your on-prem configuration into the cloud. But if we're thinking about multiple sites and multiple locations and that kind of stuff, we, we want to see something for on-prem to on-prem as well to kind of help with that. Now, there's some uh, other CTPs like Paul and, and Shane who have written a tool to do that with PowerShell and other scripts out there to do that. But you know, we like to see that, that functionality kind of more built in to kind of make that even better for making sure that we're getting settings, configurations, that kind of stuff across multiple sites if we're doing just single site, single zone type of architecture in our environment. So let's talk about infra infrastructure components considerations. Uh, these are some of the things that uh, I've been coming into uh, recently. Uh, one of the main thing here is our decision, right? So where are they going to live? Are we going to go on-premises? Are we going to go sort of cloud where we have a mix of on-prem and using cloud control plane to kind of leave some things on Citrix to handle to make that uh, availability available and redundant, or look at a hybrid model where we're, we're gonna have some things on-prem, some things through cloud, um, even some workloads in the cloud as well. So, you know, first thing is we gotta kind of decide where the infrastructure is gonna live. And again, that comes back to our requirements that we talk about um, in here. One thing that Ryan uh, talked about too was saying, you know, if we're going to go with the cloud model from Citrix, maybe bringing some things on-prem still, like like storefronts, like the gateway, but leaving some of the core components like SQL and controllers and licensing in the cloud for Citrix to handle using localhost cache, and that way we can have redundancy built in if we have to come back on-prem if the cloud is unavailable and, and so forth. And the next thing here is going to be, um, you know, more things we, we talk about when we go to on-prem, hybrid, or cloud is deployments. And we talk about deployments, our time to value. We all know that cloud can be faster because we're not waiting for infrastructure. We're not waiting for things to be hooked up. We're not making sure that we're accounting for power and cooling and networking and so forth. So what's my time to value for the deployment? Um, and that's where things like in our current state of things with COVID, you know, we saw an uptick of people needing more capacity quickly. And some chose the cloud because there were some lead times on getting gear in uh, to on-premises to be able to expand their footprint for the increase of remote workers they have in their environments. Uh, troubleshooting, you know, on-prem versus high versus cloud. Um, on-prem, we have full visibility. Going to cloud, we may not have full visibility. Hybrid, we have partial visibility. Image management, you know, the main thing here is if I'm doing multiple clouds or multiple on-prem and clouds and I'm changing hypervisors, changing infrastructure, what's the work there for image management? Do I have automation built into play? Do I have tools to where I can, I can easily change that from hypervisor A to hypervisor B, or from cloud A to cloud B. Infrastructure management, you know, if I'm going to cloud, I'm kind of reducing what I have to do on the infrastructure side, but I don't have all the troubleshooting. There's some things I can't control. How much control do I want? Um, where it's on-prem, you know, I have full accountability for power, for cooling, for networking, for all those different components. Um, and then cost, you know, going from hybrid to cloud to on-prem, what's that cost going to be? What's that cost model look like? Uh, and so forth. So those are the things to think about there. And then think about your hardware and core components here. Um, things like uh, protecting against, we talk about power failures, multiple power circuits, eliminate any failure, whether it's on-prem or cloud. Um, that's, you know, multiple pods, multiple failure domains, looking at different cloud providers even, or within one cloud provider, multiple availability zones. What's my connectivity look like? Multiple circuits for that. Um, make sure different access points of the building, because that example I gave from when I worked at a, uh, when I was on the customer side before I, when I started my career early on, uh, look at your core networking, uh, multiple uh, paths for networking, uh, infrastructure, Active Directory, DNS, DHCP, making sure that's accounted for. Uh, data, again, that's one of the most important ones because of that, so making sure the data is there, and then looking at your multiple power and network paths as, as well as you're looking at those. Uh, high browser selection. Um, here's one, um, you know, based on, you know, cost, management, adoption, performance, availability, ecosystem, feature set, updates, you know, do I have any kind of single points in failure in hypervisor? Do I have redundancy built in my hypervisor to where I can withstand something going down and HA and management API is going over to 
uh, another part of it? Do I have to buy third-party pieces for any kind of replication, um, multi-site, death recovery, and so forth? Um, you know, the bigger the, the pods of these out there, the longer the update cycles. What does the maintenance look like? And then, again, does it include my licensing? Do I have to pay an extra cost to bring things in? All those things you can think about when it comes to hypervisor selection. SQL availability, you know, with, with localhost cache coming back, this is not as big of an issue. Um, but in the least connection time, you know, we have still had to account for, you know, what's my SQL cost there, always on availability, basic availability, uh, clusters, database mirroring, VMHA, localhost cache, and, and so forth uh, when it comes to uh, SQL availability. And then when it comes to Active Directory, one of the main things um, I see here and it's always talked about is sites, configuration, OU structure, and, and management for, for DFS. And that's where we'll talk about that here with this one. So the main thing is sites and services. This one I always hit because you get into people and they do multi-site, multi-location, multi-data center. They don't really account for their subnets and making sure that the resources in those subnets always go to the proper and closest services for log on times, for policy and so forth. Again, user experience. So making sure that we're architecting out our sites and services with the proper subnets, the proper locations, uh, making sure that we have uh, global catalogs in all those locations, making sure there's no interruption to user experience when it comes to Active Directory sites and services. The next thing will be is our OU structure based on where I land. You know, am I going to have a, a thought out built out OU structure so I can have my different configuration sets from site A to site B, my persona pass, you know, again, if I'm in the cloud, I may have a different set of policies for some things versus I'm on-prem. If I'm on site A versus site B, I may have different things there too as well. Um, and then I guess in Persona, one of the big things here with Persona, I'm speeding up a little bit because I'm kind of a little bit behind on time, but I'm getting through this here. So with Persona, uh, a couple of things are coming around lately with Persona, um, especially with Citrix. You know, We're looking at hybrid where it's a mix of, with profile management or even some third party, it's a mix of disk and files, so containers, um, or we're looking at um, all containers where things like FSLogix, the user layer from Citrix app layering, the personalization layer that came out in 1912, um, FSLogix, and then third party too as well. But the biggest thing here is when it comes to Persona, um, is, is that built in to where I can replicate that Persona, move it around pretty easily, and be able to recover that in location, or do I need to bring in third party services for that Persona? Um, FS Logix is the is the more popular one lately because the Microsoft acquisition, pretty much everyone owns it. Cloud Cache at first was kind of was kind of um, an issue, but I've been testing a lot in latest versions and Cloud Cache um, in the 2004 preview and higher has been fixed a very a lot and improved. So performance is there and that works very well. And so again, that's how Persona because without Persona we really can't get all of our data and our configuration with that. And then looking at our different things for. Replication, DFSR, the, the implications there, storage replica built into Windows, third party like backup to peer, uh, looking for active, active, multi way, delta changes, you know, any to any. And then again, cloud cache, do I want to use one container, multiple containers? Uh, but the main thing here is getting more active, active there with the built in replication for that. Um, and then again, just looking at these considerations for it, um, active passive or active, active pin is pretty easy. Uh, but the main thing is if you want to go full active active, that's where you got to think about that and maybe maybe bring in a third party product. Um, but these are things to think about your OU site design, uh, looking at your file storage. Um, again, back to user experience here. Image management. This one is kind of, um, you know, easy one here. We talk about this one all the time. Are we going to do non-persistent MCS, PVS? Or are we going to do full clones? Are we going to app layering where we can have connectors and export and then provision with uh, the different provisioning mechanisms? Um, the main thing here is when it comes to machine creation services, we're more at the hypervisor storage replication layer, and then just making sure that we can replicate that master image around the different locations to make sure that we can then deploy those catalogs, whether it's Windows or desktop OS uh, for machine creation services. Is that built into the hypervisor or is that third party? Same thing with full clones. The only difference here is with full clones, we're doing all of them. It's more of a passive situation because we're gonna go to one place first, replicate that over, and then go to a secondary. Uh, if we need to, so that's going to be even more application, more traffic, more, more data to account for, for full clones. Uh, PVS is easier, just moving that VDisk around. Are we going to be doing PVS storage on the PVS server um, and having more copies of it going around? Um, or are we going to have, um, you know, file st storage so we have less copies going around, easier to maintain, easier to keep track of, and, and so forth. Then we get into 
app layering. Um, if we're doing app layering, where some are, you know, accounting for the ML appliance, making sure there's really nothing built in besides VMHA, VM recovery, or doing a, a manual export import, and then looking at replication of our user layers, our elastic layers. The nice thing with elastic layers, is they're read only, so they're not really locked when they're in use. So you can just copy those. But uh, user layers, and same thing with personalization layers that are, that are the same functionality without all the app layering pieces, um, are we going to have to look at replication of that because it, it's a VHD level thing, it's the block level. When it's locked in use, you can't really easily replicate that. Do I have to have a maintenance window schedule to where they're going to replicate it? Do I have software built in, third-party software, and so forth when looking at the app layering side of things or even user personalization layers? Uh, other considerations, so I'm getting pretty good here on the time with the speed up there, is you know, uh, security. Um, I don't want to go too deep in this. Patrick, uh, who um, you know, does security sessions all the time, a lot of the great info from sessions from Patrick, so make sure you check that out. Uh, but the main thing here is proper roles, whether it's cloud, on-prem, privilege assessment, delegation, granular control of services, you know, regional rights versus global rights, um, least privilege for delegation of rights assignments, you know, those type of things making sure people have the, the proper access and not more access than they need. So if something happens, if something is compromised, you know, how far down the rabbit hole does that go uh, and so forth. And then where you can, uh, like, like Ryan was talking about, look at cloud services, whether it's for bursting, for DR, um, you know, look at there's cloud if you can for some of their services, like, you know, a prime example is Zen Mobile or you know, the new name endpoint management. If you're doing that, go to the cloud, look to maintain it. You know, all the new features for that are coming to the cloud. They're not really coming to on-prem. Um, so use cloud services where you can, but just plan for redundancy for those cloud services. If there's a failure, again, like Ryan mentioned with bringing storefront or gateway on-prem, look at you know what kind of things you can do for SaaS for the applications. Office 365 is a good one, you know, because we're basically giving them all the infrastructure where it's maintaining the data for it and the connectivity to it. Um, infrastructure as a service, cloud services and so forth, in case there's an issue. Um, you know, the gateway service for redundancy and so forth. And then again, identity, can we use cloud identity to extend our on-prem, you know, you know, those type of things as well. So those are other considerations. Um, again, those links I shared earlier for our sessions, lots of good content in there. Uh, hard to get through in 45 minutes, so make sure you show the, uh, go watch those for the sessions that we've done and then just keep your eye out for when we um, start getting the website up and, and, um, and posting more information. Uh, the last thing here um, is make sure that you get into the EUC Slack community. Uh, we have the world of EUC, lots of conversations going on in there. A lot of topics I talked about in here, plus more. Uh, a good way to interact with us too as well. All of us are in there. Uh, you can join via Slack. Uh, we also have Discord now if that's your flavor of choice for, for your chat. Um, and so that's where all of us are in there communicating daily, uh, talking about these things, the different components, uh, planning, availability, support, troubleshooting, and so forth. It, it's all a community. Uh, so go ahead and check that out. Um, and I have three minutes here, so let's check the Q&A. Um, so here. So that's a good point. Um, VJ, so smaller failure domains, um, there's a trade-off on capacity. So smaller customer now has to accommodate for the different capacity, and that, that's a good point. And that's where some of the considerations you look at, uh, smaller failure domain, you know, look at our capacity, or do I have to look at adding some specific storage to that environment? Um, you know, so there's trade-offs for both smaller failure domains and larger ones. Um, but the main thing is what's the impact to my users if something goes down uh, and so forth. Um, someone goes to Slack channel. Uh, if you uh, take a screenshot or use a QR code here for the one on the left. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I meant to slide. Sorry, here you go. Um, if you see the Slack here for the community, uh, the one on the left is for Slack. So there is the uh, QR code for that. Uh, that's the world of EUC.slack.com. Uh, the one on the right is for Discord. Um, they're both are bridged together. So whatever you see in Discord and Slack, we're going to Slack. Whatever you see in Slack goes into Discord and vice versa. And then we also too have the Citrix IRC channel in there as well as another one. And some community projects like um, the, the base image script framework and um the the, the sort of cloud community stuff um along with um things like um the community scripting stuff the euc monitoring project the power scale project even the virtual expo too as well all the chats are in there so uh there's a slide on that on the screen make sure you take a screenshot of that use the qr codes and i think that was the last of my questions in the slack channel because i didn't advance the slide there so that was on me any other questions? I'm just checking the chat here. 
um, as well with my last few seconds here. So thanks for the comments here. I, I appreciate it. Hopefully you had uh, you had some good info in here, and you know you can always catch me in the, the World of EUC Slack as well. And with that, I'm back to Mike. I think Mike might be having some technical difficulties, so I just wanted to come on and say thank you to Jarian. Um, now we're going to move on to our roundtable discussions. Uh, we have six different roundtables. You can get to a roundtable by using the widget at the bottom of your screen. It's um, the widget that looks like a roundtable with people around it. Um, Jarian's going to be leading a roundtable. Uh, Patrick Coble will be leading a roundtable. Our speaker, Ryan, will also be reading a, leading a roundtable. And um, we have Nick Pregnano doing a remote work, kind of like a work from home um, to see how everyone's been dealing with the coronavirus and um, all that kind of information. And then we have two other tables led by Citrix SE's um, networking and SD-WAN. So if everyone will make their way to um, those round tables, you, again, you can use those using the widget at the bottom of your screen. Um, otherwise, when this webcast and you'll be directed back to the lobby where you can pick a round table from there. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Darian. Thank you.